Okay, let's get started. So, of course, thank you very much, Klaus, for the introduction and for organizing this uh, workshop and inviting me. Uh, my name is Laurens Kolf, and I'm currently a postdoc at the Brandenburg University of Technology in Germany. Uh, and I will be talking to you about using the lab streaming layer to synchronize all the different kinds of data uh, that you may want to record during uh, experiments. I would like to note at this point that some of these coming slides have been clearly inspired by some slides that were given to me by uh, David Medin, who has been one of the developers of LSL for a long time. So I myself, I am not an LSL developer. I am simply an LSL user. So I will also mostly be talking to you uh, from a user's perspective. I will give you a user's perspective on LSL. So um, covering basics that you may want to know, like what even is LSL? What does it do? How can I use it in my experiments? Uh, and in some cases, how should I not use it in my experiments? So for more in-depth material, um, I will refer you to some resources on the final slides, some links. But so for now, let's just see how we experimenters, uh, we can use LSL for our experiments and also why we would want to use um, LSL. So um, as Klaus already explained, today we are trying to cover a more or less full pipeline, starting with recording data all the way to pre-processing and analysis. And so right now we're starting with recording. So here's the first question. What actually are we recording exactly? Well, uh, in pretty much every case, we are recording at least two things, right? Brain activity and the event markers that uh, we also talked about. We're obviously recording brain activity, but also to be able to correlate that activity with the uh, events taking place during the experiment. We're also recording these event markers. So we have a multimodal recording already uh, because these two pieces of information, they are fundamentally different modalities. Uh, and often also coming from different pieces of hardware, right? And now specifically with Mobi, as Klaus also already mentioned, we have, or we can have many different additional modalities as well. So let's say we have our participant right here. Of course, there's going to be brain activity that we're recording, uh, but commonly we also have motion capture, right? Maybe we're presenting our stimuli in virtual reality. Uh, maybe uh, we have some uh, behavioral data like button presses. And you know, basically anything else you can think of. So maybe there's external audio sources or light sources as we just saw. Maybe there's a device underneath the feet, so on. Uh, so the point is physiological experiments and MOBI experiments in particular, they are heavily multimodal. And this comes with some difficulties you know, because every modality you're recording potentially comes with its own file format, for example. So most EEG manufacturers, for example, they have proprietary software that writes the data that it records in uh, some format that is, at the very least, not the same format that other manufacturers use. Um, and the same goes for all the other modalities, the other pieces of hardware that you may want to record. And this applies to both the data itself uh, and to the metadata. So in case of EEG, relevant metadata would be, for example, like the labels of the electrodes that you are uh, using, their position, on the head or their impedances when you start recording, uh, these kind of things. So this, this is also information that is captured differently between manufacturers if it is saved at all, right? Sometimes you just have to mm, write these things down yourself. So the modalities you record, um, the, the more modalities you record, the more different pieces of software you need also to record this data and then to view the data or to monitor the data during the experiments, or when you start analyzing it, you may need different readers or converters or importers or what have you. And now that was just talking about the file itself, but even the data itself uh, may also be different. So even if all of uh, the data was recorded in the same standard file format, the data itself in those files can still come in different formats. So I'm talking about different data types, or your data will be recorded at different sampling rates, uh, or different block sizes, different labels. It may have just a different way to express the data than you're used to. Um, and this is, of course, something you can work with. You can work around it. You can, you can have additional analysis steps to fix that. But the more processing you have to do by hand uh, to make all the data fit together, uh, the more mistakes you're likely to make. It's just getting more and more complicated. But the biggest problem ultimately is really uh, synchronization. If you want to correlate activity in one modality with activity in another modality, you need the data in these modalities to be synchronized, 
right? But different pieces of hardware, they may have different clocks, which may also drift away from each other. Uh, and, and so what you often do, as you probably know, is like you have these tricks, we go up with these tricks to synchronize two data streams. Or we find other ways to somehow connect two pieces of hardware to each other, or to make pieces of hardware receive a trigger from a third piece of hardware and so on. Uh, sometimes you read about very creative ways that people use to synchronize data, especially if they have uh, complex setups. And I mean, one actually not very creative, more standard way to do that, for example, is the use of a photodiode or a photo sensor. Right, to measure when a visual change happens in one modality and then record that along with another modality. So that's what's happening in this figure. We have uh, the activity of a photodiode is translated into a trigger, which is recorded alongside EEG by the EEG amplifier. So the EEG amplifier is this, this golden device uh, lying on the table and this white device next to it. That's what translates the photodiode activity into a trigger like, or an event marker. So what you see here is that you're adding an additional piece of hardware just to synchronize the main hardware you already have, the screen and the EEG. And so the more modalities you have, the more difficult this becomes, right? especially also if you want your participants to be mobile. I mean, you will notice that there's a cable attached to the diode or to the screen, and that's just not always an option, right? So what I do want to say, though, is that when this does work for you, this can be extremely reliable. Okay, so a hardware connection will always have a certain reliability that software cannot replace. Okay, um, not even the lab streaming layer. But the lab streaming layer does offer solutions that will be very good and definitely good enough in almost all cases. Uh, and it solves basically all those issues that I just mentioned on the previous slide without making it complicated and without adding wires. So let's have a look at that lab stream layer or LSL in short. Um, LSL is a free and open source software framework for the unified transmission and collection of all data that can be expressed as a time series. So basically, all the data we usually record when an experiment is running uh, can be unified using LSL. And when I say unified, what I mean is that LSL basically handles the formatting of the data, the networking, so even when there's multiple different computers involved, um, and the synchronization of all the different data modalities, and also the real-time <clears throat> access to that data. Now, this uh, main LSL library that allows you to use LSL in your own code or your own programs uh, is available to be used with many different programming languages and environments. So we have Android, C Sharp, Java, MATLAB, Python, Rust. And I do also want to specifically mention Unity in this list because this is a popular environment for virtual reality programming. And so all the data you have available to you in Unity, you can potentially also record as part of your experiment using LSL. So if you have access to your data in any of these languages, and chances are you do, or if you want to have access to your data in any of these languages, you can use LSL to do so. Uh, but chances are that actually you won't even need to use any of these languages yourself because a lot of software already has been written to link devices uh, to LSL. So there's a long list of devices that are basically ready to be plugged into LSL straight away. For example, most EEG manufacturers these days, they support LSL either natively or through some, some app that exists. Uh, the same goes for motion capture manufacturers, there's eye tracking or just general human interface devices like mouse, keyboard, and so on. There's, there is a long list. Uh, and one of the links that I have at the end of uh, this, uh, these slides will get you to that list. Um, and furthermore, apps have been written already that allow you to monitor all of the data throughout the experiment. And of course, there is also a very important app that allows you to record all of the data in a single format, which we'll get to a little later. Um, so on this next slide, I just want to guide you through a little diagram that should hopefully illustrate how LSL works. Again, mostly from a user's perspective. So let's say you have your experiment, right? And there's different pieces of hardware or software that you are using. Let's say you are using EEG, motion capture, and you have some stimulus presentation somewhere. So what you then do is uh, you use an available LSL app or write your own if it doesn't exist to connect these modalities to LSL. So libLSL here uh, refers to the, uh, uh, well, any software that uses the LSL library, libLSL. 
And the result of that is essentially that all of the data coming from those modalities is automatically available in some sort of, let's call it an LSL cloud, okay? So some sort of LSL cloud on your local network. And what that means is that any other piece of hardware or software that has access to your local network also has access to all that data at the same time. So we can, for example, have a separate recording computer uh, that simply reads all of the EEG motion capture and marker data and writes it to a file. Just gets it from the cloud and writes it to a file. But importantly, this access is not exclusive, right? So at the same time, another computer or another piece of software can have access to the same data at the same time. For example, to visualize it so you can monitor it during the experiment. And we can imagine another system as well that actually reads and process the data uh, and then sends the process data back into the cloud, which can then be used, for example, again, for the stimulus presentation. Uh, so LSL in this, size, uh, in this sense prevents a single cloud, it's called the cloud, in which all data can be uh, all data can be transmitted over a local network in any direction, and the good thing about this cloud is that all data is in a more or less uh, unified format, a unified format. So the networking and the buffering and the synchronization that's all uh, taken care of. So um, these are the main advantages of LSL. It is in a more or less unified format, <clears throat> which is dictated by the LSL library. It takes care of all the networking and the buffering of the data, and it enables you also to synchronize and de-jitter all of that data. So those are the main benefits. So let's have a quick, uh, just an example of what that could look like. I have a couple of apps on my computer. I uh, need to open them real quick. So let's say I use apps um, to capture mouse button activity. That's just uh, running right now. And let's get another app that I use to record um, audio. Okay, so now we have two different apps written by two different people, but they all both use um, LSL. And one of them is sending um, information into this LSL cloud about when I press my mouse button, so that would be behavioral data. And this is just recording uh, audio and is also sending that into the LSL cloud. Now we have a third app, which is called in LSL, this is called the Brain Vision LSL Viewer, and this is a monitoring app. So this would be on the right side of the diagram that I just showed you. Uh, and what it's doing now is just looking which data is available in the LSL cloud. And I'm gonna say, okay, show me the audio stream and show me these mouse buttons. Um, and here we go. So this is the audio stream. Uh, it is recording or it's monitoring now my voice. And at the same time, when you see me pressing buttons, at the bottom of the screen, uh, you see that these buttons are also being received by this app. So it's a little bit, uh, there's two buttons at the same time. So button press and button release. That's why you have two events simultaneously. But as you can see, whenever I press a button, and while I'm talking, this data is received at the same time because of LSO. Let me get rid of this and move on. So that was just a quick example of uh, basically this diagram. So we have these two different pieces of hardware or software could have been running on different computers also sending data into the LSL cloud. And then we had one monitoring app, which again could have been running on a different computer as well, receiving that data. Um, but to come back to uh, these properties of LSL. So we have this data in a unified LSL stream format floating around in the cloud, so to say. Uh, it provides automatic networking and buffering capabilities and also synchronization and digital capabilities. Let's talk about these three things now in a bit more detail. And let me start with the uh, networking and buffering. So first of all, LSL does not re-implement networking functions. It uses uh, boost.aco, which is a library, which is standard and very reliable library. So basically what I wanna say here is that you, you can trust it, okay? But more importantly, what I actually want to say is that you don't have to think about it because LSL uses this networking library to provide higher level abstractions. So it provides outlets to send data 
and inlets to receive data from the LSL cloud. Everything else, so related to networking, you know, sockets and addresses and handshakes and whatnot, LSL does for you. You don't have to bother. All you use as the user are these outlets and inlets, basically. And we'll see some examples of that in the code later on. Uh, now, another thing is that each of these outlets uh, and, uh, and inlets, they have a buffer that automatically store data. So if for some reason there's a problem on the network, and the data is not received, it will be automatically resent and recorded afterwards. And this happens automatically. So you can configure it, of course, but you don't have to implement anything yourself. So this is one of the good features of LSL. So that's, of course, one very big advantage. Uh, it just makes data transmission very easy. But another advantage that I mentioned is this data format. So um, data transmission in LSL takes the form of streams. Right, so an LSL outlet provides a data stream, which can be read by an LSL inlet. And these streams, they have a more or less standard definition. So first of all, they of course contain the data. Uh, and for this data, you will always know how many channels it contains, what type of data is and what the sampling rate is. Uh, the sampling rate can also be irregular, in which case it's defined as a sampling rate of zero. So irregular means that data can come up anytime. But on top of the actual data, uh, each stream also has metadata, which gives you information about the data in the stream. So it specifies what the data looks like, as, as above, but it also provides a way to add uh, any additional information directly to the data stream itself. So for example, in EEG, you could specify the channel labels, channel names, maybe their position, their impedance, uh, and so on. And this is actually very important data that is not uh, that is very easy to lose if you don't save it directly alongside the data itself, right? So this is what LSL basically helps you to do. And now this uh, metadata is XML formatted, so it's basically both machine and human readable. So let's uh, have a look at that actually. Because uh, not only does it provide like the technical ability to provide metadata, uh, LSL also provides some standards as to what that metadata should look like. Uh, this is officially defined in what is now an actual ANSI standard. Uh, and this standard defines both these XML metadata blocks and also a file format to store all the data. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but for example, there is a standard metadata template, let's say, for EEG data. So it includes the channel names, the channel types, but also the unit of the data of the channel, like microvolts, millivolts. There is a field to save impedance, uh, channel locations, filter settings, information about the cap you're using, about the amplifier, et cetera. And similarly, there's also a template for motion capture data, which again includes like, channel information. Uh, and you can also make it clear, for example, whether you're using regular or quaternion based angles. Uh, and again, the units, the bounding box of the space, point markers, cameras, et cetera. So there's a whole bunch of such templates, and also gaze data, uh, et cetera. So you can have a look at this document if you're interested it's available for free but the point is that if you use any of the available lsl apps you will basically automatically also have access at least if it's if it makes use of this access to this kind of metadata and if you want to write your own lsl app you can use these standard templates uh, to know which information to include uh, but do keep in mind that not all of this information is mandatory right a lot of it is in fact optional uh, and in the hands-on session, we will see how little information is truly necessary just to get LSL up and running uh, for your own individual purposes. But at the same time, LSL does have these predefined data or stream types like EEG, like motion capture, like gaze. And this also helps you make sense of the data. Um, now, like I said, there is also a file format developed alongside LSL. And just what I want to show you on this slide is that there is also an app that allows you to record LSL streams into that data format. Uh, the app is called the Lab Recorder, uh, and the data format is called XDF. Uh, it, it's very easy. So here on the left side in the app, uh, you see, uh, I mean, in the screenshot of this app, you can see all the LSL data streams that were running at my machine or running in the cloud on the network uh, when I took the screenshot. So we have an iLink stream that was a gaze, um, a gaze capture device. We have an ActiChem that's an EEG device. We have snap markers. Those were my, my event markers from the stimulus presentation. Uh, 
And there was also another marker stream that I was not using, so I'm not recording it. So I just select the streams that I want to record. Uh, I say which file I want to record it to, I press start, and that's it. It starts recording the data. Um, and that gives you all the data in one single file, including the stream data itself, the metadata we just talked about, and time synchronization data as well. We'll get to that in a minute. So that's great. Uh, another small thing I want to point out at this point is this little checkbox uh, called bits. So this helps you to save the data, not just in a standard file format, but also in a standard directory structure. So that's another standard known as bits, the brain imaging data structure uh, that you will hear more about in the next talk. But again, all of this helps you to standardize things uh, and have everything in like one data format and one, one just general format that we're all familiar with. So LSL also helps you to do that. So here's another app uh, from this LSL ecosystem. This is called the uh, XDF browser. And it allows you to open one of those LSL XDF files that we recorded, and we can see what's inside. I mean, you don't have to use this browser. As you can, any of those languages that I showed you earlier can also open XDF files, but I'm using the uh, XDF browser because it just makes it easy. And so what I wanted to demonstrate here is what I said about that metadata. So let's say you open a random file that you have never seen before in your life, but it happens to be an XDF file. Now that's good because when you open it, you see all these different streams that were recorded in the file, and each stream has that metadata we talked about. So this file is actually one of the files uh, from, the, uh, from the drive, the Google Drive for the Mobi workshop. Uh, this is uh, yeah, vp24warp.xdf. But let's assume we have absolutely no idea what's going on in this file. Let's just open it and see what's it. So we can literally just have a look at the stream uh, at all the streams that are in there, and we can get an idea. So let's have a look at stream number one, and we can see, aha, uh -huh, this is EEG data. In fact, it's 64 channel EEG data recorded at 1000 Hertz using a brain product system on a computer called BPNC23, and it has channels called FP1, measured in microvolts, etc. So that's good, now we know. Uh, here's another stream number three. So this one is called markers, or it's of a type markers. And we, what we can see is that it sends string data at an irregular sampling rate. So these are the experimental event markers. And here's another stream. This is a motion capture stream, which tracks a rigid body. And if we scroll down a little bit, uh, we see that this stream uses quaternion angles. So again, that's good to know. That's important to know. Um, and uh, again, so all of this information is right in the file itself, in one single file, alongside the actual data. Okay, so anyway, I was telling you about those three main benefits of LSL, this networking and buffering, uh, unified data format, and the third one was synchronization. This one is, of course, very important, so let's talk about data synchronization now. So the problem you can have in your experimental setup, I already briefly mentioned it, is uh, when you use different pieces of hardware, all these pieces of hardware can have different clocks. So let's say you have your EEG clock, and it's 12 o'clock, and then five minutes later is 12.05, right? But it's actually quite unlikely that another piece of hardware has the exact same time. Most likely, this other clock is off by some random amount. For the sake of example, let's just say two minutes. Um, and now, if this offset were to be the only problem, right, then it's not too bad. We just need to measure the offset once, and then we subtract it uh, from the clock that is ahead. <clears throat> But in actuality, two normal clocks don't run at exactly the same speed. Uh, so they drift over time. So our hypothetical difference of two minutes can actually turn into a difference of three minutes, let's say, later on in the experiment. And that is not something we can fix with a simple fixed offset correction. This is more complicated. So what LSL does is it constantly measures the clock offsets uh, using a protocol called NTP, Network Time Protocol. Uh, this is not something that was uh, invented by LSL. It is another one of those very reliable standard algorithms that has existed for much longer than LSL. But it has very good applications for data stream synchronization. So what happens is every five seconds, by default, it measures the clock offset uh, as follows. So in quick succession, the four timestamps are generated between the two machines in question. So at T0, the inlet, uh, sends a package to the outlet of another device, which is received at T1. And then immediately, or as soon as possible after that, 
uh, at T2, a packet is sent back and received at T3. Now, based on these four timestamps, uh, two measures are calculated. So first of all, the round trip delay, which is basically the entire time interval minus the processing time between T1 and T2. And this indicates basically how long the transmission time is. And then there's the clock offset, which is basically like the, the mean of the two actually measured differences. And now it does that not just once, uh, but a couple of times in quick succession, and then there is like a, like a filter algorithm that selects the most reliable value. And so uh, this is how LSL constantly measures uh, the offsets between all the machines and also saves this data alongside the other data it collects. And then you can use these offsets to remap the drifting values. So in the end, everything is synchronized as you want it to be. Now I also mentioned uh, that LSL can de-jitter the data. But actually, that's not that, that special. There's not that much to say because in the end, it just makes sure that all these samples are equidistant from each other by simply regressing out any differences between them. So this is actually pretty simple, but still, it's something you would have to have otherwise done by hand, and LSL can do it for you when you load the XDF file. All right, so that's basically uh, what LSL is and what LSL can do for you. And now I just wanted to selectively mention some things from my own experience uh, and also that I've heard from other people that may be useful to you as well if you are using LSL. Uh, because some of those features that I just mentioned also have some uh, pitfalls, basically, to keep in mind. So for example, this, this buffering. Uh, like I said, LSL, by default, it automatically buffers the data for you. And this is a good feature, um, but sometimes actually you do, and sometimes actually you don't want to use that buffer. For example, let's say you're doing an online experiment and whenever a certain event happens, you want to analyze data. Let's say you want to get an event-related potential following this event. So what you want to do is you want to look at new incoming data starting at that event. Um, and if indeed you start reading from the inlet at this point in time, meaning you were not reading from the inlet before and you start reading from the inlet now, the first data you will read is actually buffered data because that is what LSL does. So in this case, you would actually have to clear the buffer first and then start reading. Otherwise, you're reading all data. So basically, you should keep in mind um, whether or not you want to start reading new or start analyzing previous data if you have a scenario like this. Uh, so keep in mind, you may want to clear the buffer uh, for your applications. Or the other option is to have like a one second buffer and then start reading one second after the event. And the advantage of that is that you would have all data available immediately without having to wait for it to arrive, for example. Now, synchronization, like I said, is one of these main features of LSL um, and it works very well out of the box, but there is also a way to break it. So that's something to be aware of as well. So like I said, the synchronization is based on timestamps. The uh, timestamps that are used for the synchronization are uh, timestamps from the LSL clock. So LSL basically has its own internal clock and it uses that uh, to provide timestamps and to provide the synchronization. But what you can also do uh, is when you create your own LSL outlet is you can provide your own timestamps to go along with the data that you send through this outlet. So for example, some hardware provides its own timestamps from its own clock. If you do that, the synchronization may not work correctly because the offsets can then be, or would then probably be calculated using a different clock than the clock that is actually used for the timestamps you're using, right? Keep in mind, so if, so LSL uses its own clock to synchronize the data and then synchronize the timestamps, but if the timestamps are themselves using a different clock, then the synchronization won't work. Uh, another thing I want to mention is that the synchronization and the jitter functions are usually applied post hoc. So when all the data is saved uh, to this XDF file, and then the uh, temporal issues are solved when you load the saved data, when you load the XDF file. But LSL can also apply these fixes in real time. Uh, so when you get the data from an inlet, it can also apply these fixes immediately to the data received from that inlet. Uh, so you can do that if you need to, uh, yeah, you can do that if you need to, but keep in mind that this uh, fixed data with, uh, with these fixes applied, then uh, replaces the original time information that you have. Uh, 
So that's okay, just to keep something in mind, uh, should this apply to you. And here, what you could do, for example, is maybe consider having a second machine record the data in parallel without those corrections, so that you can use the corrections in your online application elsewhere without destroying the data. Um, now, another keep in mind, another thing to keep in mind is that LSL does not have any information about the delay, lag, or jitter from this sample as it comes from the hardware. Okay, LSL only knows about lag and jitter on the network. So if your acquisition device or your presentation device itself has a lag of some milliseconds, um, LSL does not know about it and it does not automatically compensate for it. So LSL does not magically solve all time-related problems, but it does solve some of them. So it's good to know what it does and what it doesn't do. And there are actually ways to also include known delays and jitter into the stream metadata so that it can be compensated for. But I just want to say that LSL is not a magical solution to absolutely everything, okay? Um, and finally, one thing to be reminded of here is that LSL does not align samples. It only aligns clocks <clears throat> when it's synchronizing. So when you have two streams, let's say both of which are 100 hertz, LSL does not make the samples from these two streams coincide. It just makes sure that the linear time scale that they are on is the same. Okay, so it does not otherwise touch the samples in any way. Now, as for the de-jitter, I uh, said earlier that this is pretty straightforward. Um, so there's not all that much to say here, but there are still cases where this can also go wrong. Uh, probably somewhat obviously, but the de-jitter function assumes that there is in fact a constant sampling rate of a true non-jitter sample. And now for most dedicated hardware like the EG amplifiers, this is probably true. But in some cases, the jitter may in fact represent the actual true jitter of the data you are recording. Okay, so this can, for example, be the case for visual presentation. Sometimes it just takes a little longer to render a scene. And so the actual scene that you are recording arrives later. So it is jittered in the sense that it deviates from the actual frame rate. But so the true arrival time of the sample is actually the thing that is jittered. And then if you de-jitter this, you are actually moving it backwards in time to a point where it didn't exist yet, all right? So this is of course going into very much detail. And in most cases that we will be talking about, it's maybe like a millisecond or a couple of milliseconds. Or, um, it's not very relevant. But when you get down to the details, you may want to think also about this a little bit. And actually Marius Klug will have some additional thoughts about how this relates to virtual reality, where a scene sometimes is indeed delayed by a frame or so. Um, but again, there is specific metadata uh, that you can use to handle some information relevant to this issue and also a previous issue that I said, you can see that here, um, synchronization metadata. The main thing to remember though, is that uh, with both the synchronization and the GDATA feature, is that it changes the timestamps of your data. In most cases, this is for the better, you want this, but there can be some cases where the assumptions underlying these fixes actually do not apply for whatever reason. So if you load an XDF file and something really strange happens to your data, one thing you can do is just load the data with one or both of these functions switched off. Uh, because like I said, they are available, but they are optional. And you don't have to use them. And then you can try without it and see if it fixes the issue. And if it does, then you have a pretty good clue about what the problem is. Uh, and perhaps you can use that information to change something about your setup or about your analysis pipeline. Like I said, this is a, not a developer's perspective, this is a user's perspective. Just switch out the functions and see if that fixes it if you run into any strange issues. Now, the last thing I want to mention in this part of the session is that, um, uh, yeah, some, some general analysis settings. Because not actually a whole lot of people know that you can configure LSL in a separate configuration file. So the way to do this is you create a separate configuration file called LSL underscore API dot CFG. Uh, and you put it somewhere on your computer where LSL can find it. So it, it searches for it in specific places. You can put it in your uh, program's working directory, uh, in your user directory, also in a global directory. And if you have one or more of these, the more local one overrides the more global one. Okay, and now with this file, there are a number of things you can configure, uh, but I just want to point out a small number of them. 
So uh, um, if you want to, or if your network for some reason forces you to, you can, for example, change the networking settings, like the, the port you're using and so on. Uh, but one thing you may at some point run into is this port range setting, because this determines the range of the ports available to LSL. Now, because LSL, uh, or because each LSL stream uses both a TCP and a UDP port, it uses two ports per stream. This number divided by two is basically the maximum amount of outlets one machine can support. So when you end up having like a lot of streams coming from the same machine, uh, something isn't working, this may be the setting to look at. Uh, another setting here is the scope of the LSL cloud, basically. So you can limit it to one machine or to the local switch or to the site organization or even the entire internet if you want, although that's not a very good idea. Uh, but so this way you can basically define how large LSL should think your lab is, right? But a better way to actually do that uh, may be to use the specific lab settings that also exist in this configuration file. So here you can explicitly list IP addresses of machines that you wish to include in your lab or in the LSL cloud, if you will. So that's the known peers setting. Um, but it is also possible here to basically partition the network that you have into smaller virtual labs or virtual clouds by giving them a specific session ID. So streams are only visible uh, from and by machines that are configured with the same session ID. So if you have multiple rooms in your lab and they're but they're using the same network, this is a way you can have them not interfere with each other. So you don't like accidentally record the EG stream from the next room when you're recording. So that is the session ID setting. Um, that is basically what I wanted to say about, uh, about LSL so far. Um, this is a hands-on session. I also did like a little bit of a hands-on thing uh, earlier when I showed you the apps, but the real hands-on of course is some code. So let's have a look at some code right now. Just to show you, like I said, you probably won't need code if you just use a standard equipment, but if you do want to use code, if you want to, uh, use your own custom implementations for one reason or another. Um, LSL really makes it very easy for you because like I said, basically it, you can ignore all the networking and you just want to focus on these inlets and these outlets. And so let's just have a look what it looks uh, like in Python, for example, to send data using LSL. Um, let me get my mouse, where is it? Turn it into a laser pointer, okay. So, um, like I said, the LSL library is available in many different languages as a library and it for uh, Python is called the PyLSL. So we can just import PyLSL and from PyLSL in this example, we only need two things, the stream info and the stream outlet. And basically what we do is we define some core information about our stream, uh, like the name of the stream, the type of the stream. So this refers to one of those uh, um, metadata templates also that I mentioned before. EEG is a known type. So software that expects EEG will look for this, uh, yeah, this type. We also need to say the channel count, so how many channels we have. We don't actually need to give the channel names, but I'm doing it here in this fashion, but we need to have the channel count, the number of channels, the sampling rate, the format of the data. In this case, it's a 32-bit floating point, and a stream ID. The stream ID is supposed to be like a unique ID representing the device, for example, a serial number uh, or something like that. And this stream ID allows it to find the stream again if something goes wrong with the network. So if yes. like... Yeah. Excuse me, uh, excuse my interruption. Um, oh. There seem to be some um, 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 hiccups. Um, what kind of software do participants require now for the hands-on session? Ah, okay, um, so this would just be... Uh, um, I, I will just show it so they don't have to join me. Okay. But if they do want to join me, so this is written in Python, and this can be Python 2 or Python 3, that shouldn't matter. Um, I will also use this LSL viewer that I used before. Um, I have a link to that in the Google Drive in the utils uh, folder. Okay. And um, So there is a link it. to the LSL viewer for everyone who has not yet downloaded that. Please do that if you want to do the hands-on session, okay? Thank you, Lovely. Sorry, please go ahead. Okay, yeah, no, go ahead. Uh, thank you. 
where was I? Okay, so right, the stream ID is important in the sense uh, for when, um, uh, yeah, you have issues with the network. Like if a stream goes down for whatever reason, um, LSL will try to reopen it uh, by looking for another stream with the same ID. Okay, so we have these, there's just this basic information about the kind of stream we want to open because we're sending data, so we want to make an outlet. We turn it into a stream info object, and then we simply open an outlet by giving it the stream info. So now we have opened a stream outlet that allows us to send data into the LSL cloud that has this, this configuration. So it has a name, it has a type, it has a number of channels, it has a sample rate, data type, and an ID. And that's basically it. So now what we do is we just uh, generate data, in this case, just random data, or we get data from our machine, from our uh, acquisition device. And this line of code is the only thing really that we do to make this data available in the LSL cloud. I generated a random sample, and simply we have this outlet here, the stream outlet, outlet.push sample, the sample we generated, that's it. When we do this, it is now available in the LSL cloud to all the other computers in the network and all the other software on your machine. So this is uh, basically these couple of lines of code. Also, this, this script, by the way, is in the Google Drive. You don't have to type it, uh, copy it from the slides. This entire, these couple of lines of code is basically a, a random EEG data generator within LSL. Of course, I talked about this metadata, right? So there is no metadata yet. This is just a very basic stream information, but you can actually add a little bit more information if you want. Um, to the stream info before you open the outlet. Like I said, the stream uh, metadata is XML formatted. So what you do is you can just append ch uh, yeah, children, like XML children with specific values to that. So we can um, first uh, uh, append a channel um, section. And then for each channel, we say what label it is. So these are the, the names that I had earlier, the unit and microvolts, and that it is an EEG channel and not a fiducial, for example. And this is then uh, turned into this metadata that we also saw in the XDF browser. So the stream, uh, the score stream info is of course there, the name, the type, the channel count, and so on, but also these channel, uh, this channel information that I showed you earlier. So what we saw in the XDF browser, or when you use a, uh, you open an LSL stream in any other software, this information will be available to you in this format. Um, so you know what, let's actually just have a look at that. I'm going to run uh, this script that I just showed you. And I mean, it doesn't output much. It's just uh, since it's now sending data at 100 hertz into eight channels, because that's what we asked it to do. And let's get our viewer again, the brain vision LSL viewer. So this is sending the data into the LSL cloud. This is looking what's available into the LSL, in, in the LSL cloud. It finds our LSL random data with some ID. We can open that, and there you have it. This, uh, again, this can be running on a different computer. Um, it has nothing to do with the fact that these are both written in Python or running on my computer or whatever. It could be completely separate. They're just using LSL, and that's why it works. And it, you can also see it has this metadata. So it knows that this is channel FC, C3, CZ, C4, and so on. So I didn't do anything about that, uh, especially it reads this data from the stream directly. Um, and this is, uh, well, this was Python. I'm just gonna go one more example showing uh, the same thing more or less in MATLAB, except now we're gonna send markers. And I'm taking MATLAB just because we can, just so that this is easy as well. Um, so again, we have the same information that we uh, had before, a stream name, a stream type. This is a marker type, markers type. It has only one channel. And it has a sampling rate of zero. So a sampling rate of zero means it's an irregular stream um, um, or an irregular sampling rate. So data can come at any time or no data at all. It is a string. And we, again, we have, uh, uh, I mean, the data that we sent through it is formatted as a string and it has some ID again. Now with MATLAB, uh, we load the uh, library of LSL and then the rest is basically the same. So we have this, uh, we generate a stream info object using those data that we just uh, gave it. We also gave it a library here, that's how it works with MATLAB. And then we create an outlet using that info, basically the same as before. And now what we have is again, we're just, uh, well, this one is outlet.push sample, in this case, it's a marker. So we have just a random list of strings and we 
we, we choose a random string from that list and that is the one we send. That is our marker. Again, just as an example. Uh, let me open uh, MATLAB and show you. So I'm using MATLAB 2020A, but this should be pretty much independent of your version. Okay, so here is the script uh, that I just showed you. And the thing with uh, MATLAB is you have to add the LSL uh, library to your path. So you want to add at least the lib LSL. Uh, if you download the lib LSL from GitHub, this is what you get. You want to at least have this folder in your path as well as the binary. So libLSLMatlab and the libLSLMatlab slash bin. Those need to be in your path and then uh, it should just work. So it's sending markers and like every one and a half second or so it randomly sends another marker. So let's again look at our uh, LSL viewer. I'm gonna disconnect. And now we have still our random LSL, uh, like random EEG data and we have these markers. I'm gonna open them at the same time and you will see that whenever our uh, MATLAB code sends a marker, it also shows up here. So these are two examples, one in Python, one in MATLAB, how you can send data into your LSL stream. I'm going to have one more example about receiving data, where again, I'm gonna use Python. Um, because there is one other function that is very useful, that is the resolve streams. So resolve streams, again, this works in all the languages, but we're just using Python as an example. Um, the resolve streams function uh, returns a list of all the streams currently available in this LSL cloud that we call it. Uh, this particular script now just prints all the available uh, streams that it finds and it asks you to select one. And then it simply opens an inlet, so not an outlet, but now an inlet because we want to read data using one of the streams that you selected, right? So the resolve streams finds all the streams available and then just one of them you use it to open an inlet and that allows you to read data. And just like the uh, outlet.push sample was the code to uh, send data into the LSL cloud, the inlet.pull sample is the, uh, is, the, uh, uh, is the command to receive data from the uh, inlet that you opened. So what this script does, it just, you know, actually it uses most lines just to have you select one of the streams but it then just simply, whenever a sample is available, it prints it. So this, whenever there's no sample available, so when you already have the latest sample, it just returns uh, uh, none. So then there's uh, nothing. But when a sample is available, it just prints there. So let's also just have a look at that. The script is also available in the Google Drive. Here it is, uh, and it has found two streams, which is correct. It has found the uh, LSL markers and the random data. This is an EEG data stream. This is a marker data stream. This is again, uh, the type is uh, just saved alongside the stream. So you can notice immediately. And it's running on my computer. So we can just uh, select one, open it, and it will also show the data. So let me just, uh, put everything together. So we have our uh, MATLAB here sending markers. We had our uh, random EEG from Python. This is being read still also by the, uh, the uh, LSL viewer. And at the same time, we can have access to the same data uh, through a script that we just randomly generated right now. Um, again, also to uh, illustrate that the data access is not exclusive. You can have any number of computers have access to the same data at the same time. Okay, that is basically what I wanted to say. I will put also a PDF of this um, um, of these slides in the Google Drive uh, in a minute, and then you can have all these uh, links as well, so you don't have to type anything here either. But so this is the uh, the main LSL repository where also you find links to all the different apps that exist, so all the different devices that are supported that you can start streaming. Just documentation, and also network. Like I said, I am not a developer; I'm simply a user. So if you have a more specific question. 
there is an LSL mailing list that you can use, and there is also a Slack channel. You can click this link to get the invite to that. And that was for LSL. There is also XDF repository, uh, which also has the specific apps, and also the wiki with the metadata that you can find there. And there's also, uh, yeah, this ANSI standard that I said. The file is free, but you have to register. Um, so uh, yeah, if you want that, you can click on that link. So just to summarize what I hoped to have told you is that the LSL, the lab streaming layer, is a free and open source software framework for the transmission of time series data, which handles the networking, the formatting, and the synchronization. Many plug and play apps exist to just immediately start streaming, uh, but also monitoring and recording synchronized data. Uh, and uh, if the apps are not enough for you, the, there are easy to use libraries for your own custom applications. So, happy streaming.